really dive into talking specifically about um, Google's work in the contact tracing space, let's first set up sort of the relationship between public health and tech. You know, I think a lot of people, they hear Google and they think of this big tech company, they think of a search engine. Um, and it, there may be questions about why does Google have a, a chief health officer? Um, so could you talk a little bit about your work and the work your team does? <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe I'm the embodiment of public health and tech coming together. My, my background um, is practice medicine for 20 years, though the um, a part of my work has always been in public health. In fact, my first job um, putting myself through college was um, working at the state laboratory in Massachusetts. As, as the story will go with, with Joya, we're, we're reconnected again in the Massachusetts theme. And um, I, you know, across the journey of the work that I was doing for my patients, to provide them information and the right care and, and meet them where they were medically, translated into the work that I did when I was the health commissioner in New Orleans and uh, later when I had uh, other roles in public health practice that um, really is about thinking of people and community in the context in which they live and, and how we provide the best information, the best resources, the best services that are culturally and linguistically appropriate, meet them where they are. And, when the opportunity arose to, to join the team at Google, I was really thrilled because what, one of the things that I have learned across my journey is that having the right information at the right time can make all the difference in the world. It can literally save lives. And billions of people come to Google every day asking for information. And uh, so it is a, a tremendous opportunity to get, have that right information and those resources to people so that they can uh, make, make good choices, so that they can have the right information, so that they can participate in their own health, but also in, a, in the context of this historic pandemic, be a part of the broader health of the community, whether it's to flatten the curve or keep the curve flat as we go forward. And so it, it sounds like that there is this connection then between public health and then sort of what Google's work is and thinking about public education and, and sort of providing um, information. And so could you, I guess, talk a little bit about that link between uh, public health and public education and Google? Definitely, you know, I mean, it, it, the essential public health services are uh, include communication and um, data. And and these are, these are two areas where tech in general, but certainly Google has uh, opportunity to partner with, with the public health system and with the public for, for their health more broadly. You know, going back um, to the earlier days of this pandemic, uh, in the towards the end of January, uh, Google first leaned in to start to put um, information out to the public about how to find resources in their their local community um, from the CDC or from from other authoritative uh, resources. So on the search page, we put up knowledge panels, is the way that we describe it, and we did. Um, develop an SOS alert, which is something we've done for um, other crises. And in this particular historic crisis, we wanted to be certain that when people uh, went on to search that there was uh, authoritative information, uh, which is always there, but certainly very prominently displayed um, and, and do that in partnership with public health authorities. So we began our journey really very much an information um, a way of making certain that people knew how to get the right information at the right time to save lives. I think that um, the, the journey for us over the course of the last few months has been to continue to lean in on how we provide uh, information in partnership with public health authorities in local local areas, um, directing people in a certain state to their state's health department, helping people get information about about testing. There, there's also been a though uh, been a suite of resources that we wanted to provide to the healthcare community, whether that was uh, for um, healthcare providers that may not have access to PPE. For example, we did a partnership with the CDC Foundation. Though the scale of the company and the opportunity for us to partner with um, public health around things like helping public health understand if their um, blunt policies around social distancing to flatten the curve were actually having an impact on behavior in the community. That's our community mobility reports. We were asked um, by public health um, uh, agencies all across the world, including uh, some of my colleagues here in the U.S., could we help them have a better evidence-based way to understand the, the policies around social distancing or shelter in place? Mm -hmm. And we've, um, which I think we'll talk about um, more later, in addition to, to that sort of work, also been working to support public health in this really um, essential work they're doing for contact tracing, which is very human resource intensive, very complex, uh, incredibly important to keep the curve flat and prevent future outbreaks. 
um, and and um, give time and space for healthcare and importantly science um, to do the work they need to do to create treatments and very importantly a vaccine. So that that work around uh, providing an additional set of digital tools, uh, exposure notification for the contact tracing community is is one of the other areas where we've been supporting the public health. So, you know, as we think as we've thought about this pandemic, it's support the users, which is the consumer. There's also a healthcare system and a scientific community where we've been partnering, and and then of course public health. And for me, I mean, Whitney, this is you know, um, just a, a wonderful opportunity for big tech to come together with the public health infrastructure. Public health, mm -hmm. as Joy was sort of articulating before, is an often an unsung hero. It saves your life every day, but you didn't know it. And um, uh, it is also a, a pretty under-resourced part of our health infrastructure globally, but especially in the US. It's something I worked on a lot before I came to Google. And so the opportunity to partner and, and do as everything that we can as a company, and in this case of contact tracing in partnership with Apple, to create a very privacy promoting, useful, helpful product that is gonna be a part of the bigger contact tracing is something that we feel really proud of and look forward to con you know, continuing to work with public health. In fact, we were on the phone this morning with a suite of public health um, groups from across the country, listening again to what would be uh, helpful, what questions that they have and as we think about um, rolling out the, the system. This is the way that we've been for the last many months at, at Google. And I'm just really, uh, you know, I'm, I, I landed at a place uh, just a few months ago, I just started at Google where we can have an impact on what people know all across the world. And I'll tell you as a public health professional and as a doc, that is one of the most critical things. People need to have the right information so they can they can help navigate their health journey, um, but, but also especially in this pandemic because it's gonna save lives. That's great, thank you. I mean, and I guess to, so to talk more about this contact tracing, um, system and the, the exposure notification app. Just, I mean, we've, we've read so much about this. I think, could you describe just a little bit about how the app works? What exactly are users seeing? Um, what information is being collected? Uh, just give us sort of a broad sense of what this app does. Yeah, uh, let me let me just start by explaining what it is. And and um, it, it's actually not even an app. It's just an API. It's a, it's a, um, a, a system that, um, allows a, a public health agency to create an app um, that and, and only the API, this this doorway to, to the phone system is available to public health. So it's not designed uh, for any other purpose than to support public health and the work that they're doing in COVID-19 in contact tracing. Um, the, the second uh, piece of this is that we wanted to build a system that was uh, privacy promoting, that really put the user first, gave them the opportunity to um, opt into the system and opt out um, whenever whenever they wanted to do that. So they also have some control um, uh, over over how they're engaging and using their their phone basically as a part of keeping the curve flat around the world. The, um, the, the system was developed in response to requests that we were getting um, about how could um, technology, particularly smartphones, uh, be be useful in in contact tracing. And as we, you know, th thought this through and talked with public health experts and academics and, and privacy experts, it was pretty clear that obviously contact tracing is a complex endeavor that does require require human resources because there's a lot of very, um, um, very particular things that you need to do in having conversations with 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 people as part of contact tracing. On the other hand, um, there's some some opportunity to better inform the contact investigators with things like um, a, a particularly exposure log. So one of the things that happens when the contact tracer calls you or visits you is they ask, hey, in the last certain number of days, and in the case of COVID, you know, it would be a couple of days before symptoms developed. Can you, you know, tell us a story of what, you, what you've been involved in doing and, and so that we can begin to think through where you might have been to the grocery or to church or um, what other activities and, and with whom you might've been into contact. And, there's some, some amount of recall bias in that for all of us. Like we, we, we forget where we might've been. And there's also a, an amount of uh, anonymous contact. So there are times when we're out in the world on a bus or in a store, and um, we may have come into prolonged and close contact with someone and wouldn't know who they were. And so the augmentation that the exposure notifi notification system provides is designed to fill in those gaps. 
and to, and to mm -hmm. expedite um, the notification to public health of who has a positive test because the person would have notified, they trigger something that notifies public health, and then to fill in some of those gaps in the, in the, in the, in the um, prior exposure. What it does not do is it does not use GPS or location to track people. So we, uh, the mm -hmm. system actually uses something different called Bluetooth low energy, which is um, privacy preserving. It doesn't drain the battery and it, it makes it more um, also interoperable between both Apple and the Android system. So it's more useful, not only in the US context, but, but globally. So we uh, built this system in response to some requests to help augment the contact tracing systems. We wanted to do it in a way that was user controlled and privacy preserving and um, had, tech, had technological features that would allow public health to um, augment the exposure, the exposure log in a way that um, would accelerate um, the work that they needed to get done to interrupt the transmission, keep the R naught less than one, and um, do that in a way that um, we would also be able to partner with public health to think about risk scoring, which we could talk more about any of these areas that you want. But I, I, I think the, um, maybe the, one of the most important things that I wanna say, Whitney, is how grateful um, Apple and Google are. I'll take a moment to speak for my colleagues at Apple to the, um, the great partnership from public health across the world and uh, to academics and to others who have helped us think through how this can be, how the exposure notification system fits into the broader contact tracing portfolio and how it does it in a way that really respects and protects privacy and also is useful to public health. We're, we're still on this journey with them, and uh, but I really uh, believe that we're gonna be able to, to help and I'm looking forward to being a part of the great work that public health's gotta do on the front lines every day, been doing, frankly, uh, but needs to, to be able to step up. That's, that's great, I mean, thank you for that uh, really detailed explanation. And uh, oh, and you know, we actually have Chris here with some questions from our community. So why don't we turn there really quickly? Yep. Uh, questions pouring in, Karen. Um, here's one from uh, Vishal Gubuksani. Uh, Gubuk I've pronounced that horribly wrong, but make up your own mind. Vishal, we'll connect later and you can tell me how to say that. Fabulous <laughs> last name, I love that. <laughs> it, it, That's a <laughs> how, how should employees think about returning to work with so many conflicting messages? This has been um, an important part of my work for the last few months. <laughs> the, um, you know, I joined Google in December and sort of all this started happening. Uh, the pandemic in, the, in um, the world, of course, began in November, but we got sort of very hot in many of the um, parts of the world in the last few months. And we've been thinking a lot about how to um, protect Googlers, but also protect the community. I've been talking a lot about what we've done externally. You know, internally, uh, Google made a decision to go to work from home pretty early. We, uh, believe that we could. We believed that uh, in all the places across the world where we have offices that the um, more we could not only model, but frankly, just um, be a part of uh, flattening the curve, that we would be good citizens. And um, we, so we have been uh, fairly, um, I, was, I don't know if the right word is conservative or, or assertive about it, because we really wanted to make sure that we were um, doing everything we could just to be, to, to get people to shelter in place and, and, socially, and socially distance. A lot of other companies um, have been doing the same. And um, I, I think the choices that people are making are gonna be predicated on um, a whole array of factors, the rates of local transmission, um, governmental expectations, the, um, um, the ability to work from home, uh, the, the individual characteristics of the workers themselves, how much risk they might have, or how much risk it would be for them to bring that back into their household if they have people living in their household who would be at increased risk from morbidity and mortality from suffering and death from COVID. Um, so these are individual and, and local uh, considerations. I think for us as a, as a company, um, we want to, as, as we've talked about publicly, we want to um, continue to be a part of um, the public health solution around uh, social distancing. And so that for us means continuing to encourage work from home for our employees and, and really uh, only be in if it's, if it's essential that people are in the workplace. And we've, we've uh, said publicly that we're gonna be doing that for, for many months to come. Now, here, here's one thing I do wanna say, which is um, um, working from home has um, definite benefits, not only from, for, for the pandemic, but for some people, you know, time for, trans for, for um, commute, et cetera. I think there are, we're already learning there are some, some downsides and there 
generic downsides, even just not from work from home, but school from home and just being at home, which is social isolation is real. It causes depression. It has physical impacts on people's bodies. There's science around this. So as, as the world is weighing, um, um, mm. even beyond the pandemic, when we've achieved um, herd immunity because we've been able to vaccinate the world with a functioning vaccine that, that, that cr creates immunity, I think uh, probably a lot of workplaces are going to want to encourage work from home. But I just want us to also to remember that part of, of humanity is, is community. And, and so we'll have to be thinking through mm. how we balance uh, the, those activities. Uh and of course, there are huge swathes of the economy um, that can't work from home. Uh, we're we're right. a lucky few who can, who can. And speaking of which, um, here's a here's a question from Othel Kerr. Uh, vulnerable communities seem to be receiving a disproportionate amount of misinformation. What is Google doing to help make sure these communities are receiving accurate news rather than fake news? You know, uh, vulnerable communities is where I, I have spent most of my career focused. Um, I, I think w many things that we've learned as a society in this pandemic uh, were things that we frankly should have known. And, and, and before I get to the information, I'll just talk about access to services, which is to say, um, and to brag, I guess, on my hometown of New Orleans. And, and you know, w one of the early things that New Orleans learned was that, um, or remembered or whatever, um, was that drive through testing only works if you have a car. So you need walk-up testing and it needs to be in the neighborhood. Um, we need to meet people where they are. And uh, it's, a, it's thematic of all the work that we did after Hurricane Katrina in, in New Orleans was to build back a healthcare and a public health infrastructure that was community oriented, built with community, not for community. And of all the, the many things that I, I really do hope last from this pandemic, um, uh, one of them though is, is that we're being much more conscious of building with and um, with especially vulnerable communities and, and building out policies and processes that are as inclusive uh, as possible. For, um, for Google information, uh, we, we start with, um, on the search platform, for example, um, adding up knowledge panels that we spend time making sure are linguistically and um, culturally appropriate. We, we tend to start uh, globally with um, global authoritative groups like the World Health Organization or the National Health Service or CDC. And then we begin to, 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 to uh, build down to more focused jurisdictions. Um, on other platforms um, that we have like YouTube, we've built out special channels um, where, where we do, because it's a platform and we can host um, content, we've, we've partnered with creatives, we call them, I don't know, as a new, new thing for me, because uh, I'm a doctor, <laughs> but we partner with creatives and influencers who, who, whose reach resonates with communities. We have had particular programming, for example, for seniors, African Americans, so vulnerable takes on a lot of meaning for us globally and in the U.S. context. Our work is not done, uh, uh, and we certainly uh, every day are thinking about how we can do more to see that the information is accessible, um, accurate, um, and, and also, frankly, interesting so that people want to engage. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Karen. I'll be back in a bit with some other questions. Thank you, Chris. And, you know, this is really a wonderful talking about sort of more broadly where you see sort of tech and public health going and specifically talking about these vulnerable communities. And, you know, I think um, one thing even just beyond Google, it, it will be interesting to sort of hear your thoughts on where you see tech in general better serving um, public health. I mean, if there are spaces that you think no matter which tech company we're talking about, um, we could all sort of come together to to better serve the community. Are, do you have any, any thoughts on that? I could spend several hours talking to you about that. <laughs> um, but maybe I'll, I'll just start um, by saying that um, you know, I, I came to, to tech um, uh, through, the, through the pathway of direct patient care and public health service in local community. And I ended up um, in, um, in a role in the federal government as the National Coordinator for Health IT, which uh, for my background uh, felt unusual to me. I'm just being honest. And, and I thought, well, I'm not really a tech person. But the secretary at the time said, that's exactly why we need you, because we need to apply tech. And, and she had had the um, unfortunate um, experience of hearing me chirp about um, how public health needed more timely data to, to make better evidence-based policy on behalf of community and with community. This is a, a source of frustration for me as a local public health officer that sometimes the data I was working on 
um, though great, was stale um, by the time I needed to make decisions about um, chronic disease interventions or mental health or even uh, violence or intimate partner violence issues in my community. And so the, the desire to make data useful and accessible um, to support people and communities um, is something that's been burning in me for a long time. And what I have learned since I have um, been out in Silicon Valley is that that desire burns in um, the bellies of many people who work at Google and Apple and other companies that, and it's been really um, um, wonderful uh, to see uh, during this horrible time of the pandemic, uh, the uh, incredibly brilliant uh, engineering and programming and other minds at a company like Google turn their attention on how can we partner with consumers and with public health to do the right thing. To, to bring the resources that we have to bear. And, and I say I could talk all day about it because I have many um, examples from the work that we have done at Google. Maybe I'll just um, uh, point out a couple. And one is to say that um, um, we very early on wanted to find a, a crisp way to, to help people understand what they could do to protect themselves and their community to get the to flatten the curve, get the R not less than one, and just do the five work that our um, our teams uh, largely in marketing, but then everyone, a lot of other people weighed in, and it required massive amounts of talent to put that avail, make that available on our landing page on search, and then um, uh, fold it out more broadly. We did that in partnership with the World Health Organization, then the CDC, then with uh, countries all across the world to get simple messaging about staying home if, if you can, and coughing into your elbow, washing your hands. These are basic public health messages that public health has um, been, uh, frankly, even in flu season, trying to, to get the word out, but it became um, the, the resources at a company like a Google and the reach to billions is a, it's a platform and a set of talents that aren't even the, the, the technical computer vision kind of stuff that we would typically think about. Um, I, many other companies um, in, in Silicon Valley have weighed in in the same way. I think similarly, We've been thinking through how we can um, use tools like um, the um, community, community mobility reports. This is something, a business factor like we have for restaurants, the, the you know, engineers and scientists said, what if we applied that to, to retail and, and grocery stores and transportation to get a snapshot mm -hmm. in a community of whether people were using those, those uh, areas less, whether people were adhering to local public health uh, expectations and and, and sheltering in place and, and give that information not only to public health, but to the public to help inspire them to be um, to do more for their community uh, as, as well as for themselves. So there has been, um, I, I think what I'm trying to say, Whitney, is um, I think there's a natural marriage and, and it, uh, COVID has been an accelerant use case to demonstrate how that can work. And um, I, 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 it is my uh, expectation that companies like Google are um, who certainly for us, it's in our DNA to be involved in health. Um, we'll we'll want to continue working on on this going forward because it's it's really um, not just good for um, what we need to get done in this pandemic, but public health and prevention are part and parcel of, of how we create opportunity and equity um, in, in all communities across the world. So I'm passionate about the work of public health and very passionate about partnership. Can I just say one more thing, I, um, which is um, to say, that one of the first things that I did um, before the pandemic started, uh, you know, I meant I just started in December and, and in January I did a listening session with consumers about what they wanted. And, and they said something uh, kind of similar to what you said, which, which I just want to call out. And that is they wanted um, partnership, they wanted transparency, and they really felt like there was quite a lot that tech in general could do to help them on their health journey. But their, their ask was that we did it in a transparent way and that we did it with, uh, in, in a partnered way with them. And so as we move out of the pandemic and we're thinking more about consumers, I wanna carry some of this, this spirit also of prevention and helpfulness and transparency um, and, and into the work that we're gonna to continue to do for people every day.